This video will cover ventilation and control of breathing. The learning objectives that we'll cover include the mechanisms regulating ventilation, the mechanics of ventilation, and also conditions that can impair breathing or ventilation of the lung. The first learning objective is explain the mechanisms that control and regulate breathing, or as we'll call it, ventilation. So how much air is ventilating into or out of your lung? First of all, you might think about why do we even need to breathe in the first place? Well, our atmosphere is full of gases like oxygen and nitrogen, even some carbon dioxide. So we need the lungs to ventilate in order to get oxygen in close contact with our body cells and also to get rid of carbon dioxide or CO2. So that's why we need to breathe. We're moving oxygen into our body and carbon dioxide out of our body through the lungs. If we look at our cells, it reminds us, well, why do we need oxygen in the first place? Well, cells need oxygen, and they make lots of CO2, and this comes back to cell metabolism. So if we look at any basic cell in the body, most all of them have a mitochondria, and so when we look at met cell metabolism, we can take glucose and make a tiny bit of ATP when we convert glucose to pyruvate. We call that process glycolysis but it doesn't make a lot of ATP. So we take that pyruvate, fatty acids, and amino acids, and nutrients, shuttle those into the mitochondria, along with oxygen, and we produce lots and lots of ATP through chemical reactions. We also produce some byproducts in addition to ATP, like heat and carbon dioxide. So this is why you're, you continually have to breathe. Our cells need oxygen, and they produce CO2 in order to make ATP. You notice this when you exercise, you increase cell metabolism, and then you need to start breathing deeper and faster. Again, why are you ventilating so much when you exercise? Well, again, your cells are using up and needing more ATP, and so you need to get more oxygen to those cells and more CO2 out of your body. So anytime you change cell metabolism and the metabolism of your body, that's basically needing more ATP. So as you produce more ATP, you consume or use up more oxygen and you produce more CO2. This leads to a way that exercise scientists can actually measure your body metabolism both at rest and during exercise. They can measure something called VO2 or simply oxygen consumption and this really represents all the oxygen consumption of the cells of your body. You can also measure CO2 production and you can do this with a mask at your mouth breathing or excuse me measuring what you're breathing in and out of your body and so when you exercise most of those active cells are skeletal myocytes. So ventilation of our lung is the air we breathe in or breathe out in a minute. Sometimes you might breathe a lot of air in and out, four liters, sometimes you might breathe um, less or more. So we call this amount of air that you ventilate into or out of your lungs minute ventilation. We often abbreviate it VE because it's easy to measure the amount of air you expire. So what determines minute ventilation? Well, in order to calculate it, we simply need to know your respiratory rate in breaths per minute and your tidal volume. Tidal volume simply means the amount of air you breathe in or out per breath. So whether you're breathing a lot or breathing a little depends on your respiratory rate and your tidal volume. So let's say your respiratory rate is 12 breaths per minute and your tidal volume is 400 mils of air per breath. That's about a soda can worth of air breathe in or breathe out per breath. So we can calculate now your minute ventilation multiplying those together we get 4,800 mils of air moving in or out of your lungs per minute. 4.8 liters per minute is your minute ventilation. And that basically just tells us how much air you're breathing in or out. This is important, obviously, to get oxygen into your lungs and into your body and to get CO2 out of your lungs and out of your body. If you increase your ventilation, you increase the amount of oxygen getting into your lungs. If you decrease your ventilation, you decrease the amount of oxygen getting into your lungs. So in this way, our body is going to continually adjust our minute ventilation all day long in order to maintain homeostasis. So adjustments in your breathing or ventilation all day long are basically going to end up regulating the body's oxygen levels, the body's CO2 levels. And again, those are things we want to keep constant.
So in the brain's quest to maintain homeostasis, at least related to ventilation, we're going to adjust ventilation up and down all day long in order to match our metabolism so that our oxygen levels in our body stay very constant and the CO2 levels in our body stay very constant. And as we'll learn, the CO2 can affect our pH. So again, stability is maintained by adjusting our ventilation all day long. The regulation of ventilation is really centered in our medulla oblongata. So we regulate our breathing using that medulla oblongata, which we called life support before. So the medulla is able to send out impulses through a peripheral nerve called the phrenic nerve. And those action potentials reach the skeletal myocytes and muscle of our respiratory diaphragm, causing us to breathe in. And so ventilation, including our respiratory rate and our tidal volume, is continually adjusted by our medulla. Scientists have actually cut out brain slices from the medulla oblongata, and what they see are those brain slices contain pacemaker neurons. These pacemaker neurons continually send impulses even though they're removed from the brain. In this brain slice, these neurons continue to generate action potentials, and they send out bursts of action potentials which match the basic respiratory rhythm. So these medulla pacemaker neurons shoot out impulses at about 10 to 16 per minute. So our basic respiratory rhythm is set in the medulla oblongata. Scientists discovered these neurons in the early 90s, and they named these neurons the pre-Botzinger complex. We'll just remember it as the medulla. So the medulla sets the pace for our respiratory rhythm by sending out action potentials to the respiratory diaphragm, which is skeletal muscle. One thing you might wonder is how does the brain know when it should adjust ventilation up or down? So the brain actually needs to monitor either directly or indirectly CO2 levels and oxygen levels in the body in order to know how much ventilation we need. So remember our heart is pumping blood to our lungs and then that blood returns to the heart in this pump throughout the body including our brain. So the medulla oblongata actually has neurons that monitor the arterial CO2 levels so that when that blood reaches the brain in the medulla, these central chemoreceptors actually detect and monitor the CO2 levels. These are probably the most important in regulation of ventilation. Next, the carotid arteries, or peripheral chemoreceptors, have cells and neurons that monitor our body's oxygen levels, and these neurons then can send signals back to the medulla, and these are probably the second most important in regulating ventilation. So now our medulla oblongata has information about arterial oxygen and arterial CO2 levels, and again the medulla's job is to keep those constant all day long throughout the day. So remember that the blood is pumped from our heart to our lungs, and so whatever's happening in the lungs in terms of ventilation affects the oxygen and CO2 levels in our blood and in our body. So let's look at an example of regulation of ventilation with sort of an easy to imagine example. Let's say you hold your breath. So again, we can hold our breath for a few seconds. And if you hold your breath, you're not ventilating your lungs. You're not, in, you're not having any ventilation. Because you're not getting new oxygen and new air into your lungs and CO2 out of your lungs, the amount of oxygen drops in your lungs and the amount of CO2 builds up. As your heart pumps blood to your lungs, it means that the blood returning to your body from the lungs has reduced oxygen and higher than normal CO2 levels. So the first place we'll detect this is in the medulla and those central chemoreceptors, they'll detect higher than normal levels of CO2, which will make the brain unhappy and make you want to ventilate or want to breathe. Also, those peripheral chemoreceptors might detect the reduced oxygen levels, send that information back to your medulla, which make you want to breathe as well. So eventually, that urge to breathe will overcome your voluntary breath hold, and you'll start ventilating. And as you start breathing normally again and take some big breaths of air, the oxygen levels will return to normal, and the CO2 levels will decrease to normal, and then your medulla will detect the normal CO2 and the normal O2 levels, and your ventilation will eventually go back to normal. So the central chemoreceptors monitor CO2 themselves and the peripheral chemoreceptors send afferent information back about oxygen. So the single most important factor in determining our ventilation and breathing is probably the central chemoreceptors monitoring of CO2. This applies to most normal life, resting conditions, and most situations in the body.
Secondary, but also helpful, is going to be the carotids and peripheral monitoring of arterial oxygen levels. But again, the most important factor is CO2 in the brain. Once the medulla decides to increase ventilation and stimulate ventilation, it sends action potentials down peripheral nerves to our skeletal muscle diaphragm. These nerves originate from our cervical spinal nerves, C3, C4, and C5, which then combine up to make the phrenic nerve, and these signals have to reach the skeletal muscle diaphragm in order for it to contract. Any spinal cord injury at the higher levels of our cervical spine can cause interruption of these signals. If these signals are interrupted, the diaphragm won't contract, and you can't ventilate, and you cannot breathe. The next learning objective is to distinguish between the mechanics of ventilation during inspiration and expiration. So basically, what are the mechanics of breathing? One of the things we got to keep in mind is that our lungs, as tissue, always want to recoil. So they're kind of like a very elastic balloon that at pretty much any lung volume, they try to collapse. They try to collapse and push air out, just like a balloon that's always trying to deflate and push the air out. You might wonder, well, why does the lung always want to recoil? Well, the lungs are made of a lot of elastic fibers, and so they're very, very elastic tissue. And they also are filled with fluid, a tiny little lining layer of fluid on all those little air spaces, and the fluid and the water molecules are attracted, which causes surface tension. So a couple of things are trying to cause your lungs to constantly collapse. One is the elasticity of those little tiny air sacs that make up the lung and those elastic fibers. And then the other thing is since our lungs are filled with air, we need a tiny little bit of fluid to keep those living cells that make up our tiny little air sacs alive and moisturized. So that lining fluid that's on those microscopic little air sacs Water molecules are attracted to each other, and so when you have these little tiny air sacs and a lot of water molecules in close contact, it creates something called surface tension. And that surface tension and the elasticity pretty much always make your lungs want to collapse. Here you can see in this video, we're actually forcibly positive pressure inflating the lungs. But you see, whenever you're not trying to inflate the lungs, they naturally recoil and they naturally collapse. So again, very elastic tissue in our lungs. And also that fluid surface tension causes them to constantly recoil. So what keeps your lungs from recoiling and collapsing, and what keeps them inflated in your chest right now? Well, it's kind of interesting the way it works. If you remember your lungs, they have a double layer of protection. They have that visceral pleura, and then they also have, lining our chest wall, a parietal pleura. And these two layers are going to help keep your lungs inflated. So if we draw here the chest wall, surrounding our lungs. We've got some ribs in there in our chest wall. We also have our diaphragm at the bottom of the thoracic cavity. That skeletal muscle diaphragm is going to be important for breathing. So we basically have our visceral pleura on the outside surface of our lungs and the parietal pleura lining the inside of our chest wall. And there's a tiny little bit of fluid in there in this intrapleural space. And that fluid is going to be important in keeping our lungs from collapsing. So this fluid-filled space is often called the intrapleural space. Sometimes it's called the pleural cavity. So your lungs want to constantly recoil. The chest wall tends to want to pull out. And that fluid keeps the chest wall and the lungs glued together. And actually, if you've ever experienced two plates or two pieces of plastic with fluid between them, you know how they kind of get glued together by that fluid. And so that fluid between the lung and the chest wall has a negative pressure, and it keeps those two layers glued together. So we just need to remember that the fluid around the lungs in that intrapleural space creates a negative pressure which essentially glues the chest wall to the lung and keeps those two layers together. Anytime you'd have a disruption of that negative pressure in that fluid, the lungs will collapse. And we can actually see that in a couple examples.
So what happens if your chest wall or your lung wall is ever disrupted? Well first let's look at a spontaneous rupture of your visceral pleura. And this can happen sometimes. You can get a spontaneous collapsed lung. What happens is uh, air starts to fill into that fluid space. We lose the fluid glue. We lose the negative pressure. Air fills the intrapleural space and our lung collapses like it naturally always wants to. Similarly, if your chest wall is ever pierced and the parietal pleura is disrupted, either from a stab or trauma, air will rush in there because of that negative pressure in the pleural space. Again, we lose that negative pressure and we lose the fluid glue and air rushes in there and our lung collapses again. So we see how important it is to have that negative pressure and that fluid in the intrapleural space. Anytime it's disrupted, our lungs would collapse. Let's look at the mechanics of breathing, or how do you actually ventilate and fill the lungs and also get rid of air. We'll start with an easy version. If you want to inspire or breathe air into your lungs, it works like this. The medulla sends signals down your phrenic nerve, causes your diaphragm to contract. When your diaphragm contracts, the chest expands, the lungs expand, and air fills and flows into our lungs. All right, so that's breathing in. What about when you want to breathe out? Well, for breathing out, we simply stop contracting our diaphragm, call that expiration. When we stop contracting our diaphragm, the diaphragm relaxes and goes back to its relaxed position. But more importantly, the lungs recoil. Remember, we said the lungs are always wanting to recoil because of surface tension and elasticity. When the lungs recoil, it basically creates an airflow out of our lungs to the atmosphere. And we breathe out. So that's inspiration and expiration. So when you inspire, you simply contract your diaphragm, which is skeletal muscle. That causes the lungs to expand, which draws air into your lungs. When you want to expire, expiration, you simply relax your diaphragm. The lungs naturally recoil because of elasticity and surface tension. The lungs then recoil and push air out of our lungs. And that's it. So now let's look at mechanics of breathing, a little more advanced version. So when we inspire or breathe in, we send signals down the phrenic nerve, causing our diaphragm to contract. The diaphragm contracts downward, sort of into our abdominal cavity. When the diaphragm contracts downwards, that increases the thoracic cavity's volume, which decreases that intrapleural pressure around the lungs. Remember, that pulls the lungs open because they're essentially glued to the chest wall. When the lungs expand due to the contraction of the diaphragm, we've now increased the lung, di uh, the lung volume. This causes the pressure inside the lungs to drop. We call this the alveolar pressure or intraalveolar pressure. So that pressure now is lower because the volume's higher. This pressure is lower than the atmospheric pressure outside in the air that we breathe. This causes the uh, air to rush into our lungs. There's a pressure gradient, 760 versus 756, and that causes air to rush into our lungs due to the pressure gradient. I like to think of it sort of like wind. So we have higher pressure outside and lower pressure in our lungs. Once those pressures equalize, then we're done breathing in, and no more air will go in. We're at end of inspiration. Now we want to expire. So how do we expire? Again, we just simply relax our diaphragm. More importantly, our elastic lungs will start to recoil because of their elasticity and the surface tension of the fluid. So when the lungs recoil, the lung volume is going to actually decrease. And we see when the lung volume decreases, it increases the intraalveolar pressure, or simply alveolar pressure. Now that pressure is 765, higher than the atmospheric pressure, and we get airflow out of the lungs. Again, I like to think of it sort of like wind.
Once those pressures equalize between the alveolar pressure and the atmospheric pressure, the airflow will stop going out of our lungs and we'll be at the end of expiration. So once those pressures equalize, then we're done breathing out. So here we go through the steps much quicker, and you can see we expand the lungs, drop the pressure, air flows in, we recoil the lungs, cause pressure out, and we breathe out. You can actually force air into the lung if you need to ventilate the lung. So an example would be uh, this breathing bag or a ventilator. You can actually push air into the lungs. Well, when would you need to do that? Well, if the brain wasn't ventilating for you, you could actually use positive pressure to force air into the lungs. The lungs would breathe out on their own during the ventilator because, remember, the lungs will recoil and create an increased alveolar pressure and push the air back out. So the bag pushes the air in and then the lungs push it out. If you ever want to take a deep, deep breath, really you just need more muscular effort. Using the diaphragm to contract really, really hard creates a very negative intrapleural pressure around the lungs and the lungs expand to a greater extent. And you get more airflow into your lungs and a greater volume. So that would be a deep breath. If you ever want to force air out of your lungs and take a sort of a forced expiration, you simply need to create um, more muscular effort using things like your intercostal muscles and your abdominal muscles like rectus abdominis and the obliques. What that does is create a positive intrapleural pressure which squeezes on the lungs. And when you squeeze on the lungs, in addition to their own elastic recoil, you force air, more air out of the lungs. So you create a very high alveolar pressure and push more air out. And so that would be a maximal forced expiration. The next learning objective and the last learning objective is to look at conditions that can impair ventilation of the lung. So when we think about the anatomy of the lungs, we can think about conducting airways and also gas exchange air sacs. And that's really what the lungs are all about. Tubes to move air and then little air sacs for diffusion. If we cut open a lung, you can actually see it's not an open balloon at all, but tiny, tiny airways, some that have cartilage to keep them open and to reinforce them. And then, of course, we have all these tiny little microscopic airways and microscopic air sacs. Think of each little microscopic air sac like a tiny little elastic balloon. So our conducting airways include our trachea, our bronchi, and they have cartilage, and as you get smaller and smaller, the tubes have more and more smooth muscle. The smooth muscle cells in our airways allow those airways to contract and dilate, similar to blood vessels, but now we're carrying air. So smooth muscle allows our airways to change size, and as we get smaller and smaller, we get to things called bronchioles, and finally we get to the tiny dead-ended little air sacs called alveoli. Each individual air sac is called an alveolus, and this is where oxygen and CO2 diffuse into and out of the air of our lungs. And then we can look in at those airways called bronchioles and bronchi. The cartilage is in our airways to help reinforce those airway tubes and to keep them open as gas flows in and out of our lungs. The smooth muscle cells, those are allow, allow us to make our airways dilate uh, and constrict. So we might call that bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction. And don't forget we have epithelial lining of our airways. Uh, some of the larger airways, the epithelium has cilia to move mucus away from the lung up towards our throat. And those cilia beat with a motion, again, away from the lungs. So our airways go from bronchi, which we can see in this picture here, since they're fairly large. And then finally we get to microscopic airways, which we can only see on a microscope, which include the bronchioles and the alveoli. The alveoli are the air sacs where gas exchange occurs, and they're really just made of a simple squamous epithelium, which allows diffusion of gases like CO2 and O2. If we look at bronchioles and bronchi, we can see that they can change size, either bronchodilation or bronchoconstriction. And what that does is change the diameter of our airways, which we know changes the resistance. So we can either increase or decrease the resistance to airflow.
There's also chemicals that can cause bronchodilation or relax the smooth muscle cells of our airways. Some of these chemicals you've heard of, epinephrine and norepinephrine, tend to relax the smooth muscle, causing bronchodilation. A drug that can do this is called albuterol. Also, nitric oxide gas and CO2 gas can cause bronchodilation of the airways. Bronchoconstriction is caused by chemicals such as histamine and acetylcholine. So now you might be able to predict whether your parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system will either dilate or uh, constrict your airways. People that have asthma need to, need to open up their airways sometimes, and we can use drugs such as epinephrine or albuterol to open the airways, and other drugs to block acetylcholine to help open up those airways as well. Again, in asthma, we need to cause bronchodilation sometimes to help those patients. Here's a histology image where you can actually see those tiny little microscopic alveoli, clusters of little air sacs. And again, they're just made of simple squamous epithelial cells, so they're not much to see, and those open spaces are where the air would be, so each of those is an alveolus. Alveolus are made of simple squamous epithelial cells that create a single layer of cells in a tiny little air sac. And of course, they're also supported by connective tissue, which has lots of collagen and more elastic fibers. Circling around the alveoli are capillaries, alveolar capillaries. And alveolar capillaries, you remember, all capillaries are made of a simple squamous epithelium as well. So this is a great way that we can allow diffusion from the air into our blood, simply crossing two cell layers and a little bit of connective tissue to get in and out. So the alveoli is where gas exchange and diffusion occurs in our lungs. We only have two cell layers to cross to get from the air in our lungs into the capillaries and in our blood. A disease you may have heard of called emphysema, which is usually caused by cigarette smoke, you can actually see how the histology of the alveoli has changed. And what we see is a destruction and damage of the little tiny air sacs in the lungs of this emphysema patient. So what happens is cigarette smoke and the chemicals in cigarette smoke activate immune cells like macrophages and neutrophils, which then start to destroy the connective tissue and the little alveoli and even the alveolar capillaries. You lose the elasticity and you lose the gas exchange areas of your lungs. So you may have heard of a disease called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. It includes a condition called chronic bronchitis and another condition called emphysema. Usually these happen together in patients with COPD. In emphysema, the alveolar capillaries are destroyed. In chronic bronchitis, we have inflamed uh, sort of narrowed airways. We also have loss of elasticity. So both of these make it very hard to breathe when you have COPD. And then the loss of the alveoli makes it very hard for gas exchange of oxygen and CO2 in and out of your lungs. So you can see why COPD is actually the number three killer, uh, I believe, in the United States. And most often, it's associated with cigarette smoke. So again, here's a cartoon of, of people with COPD. You have destruction of the capillaries, destruction of the little alveoli. You also have mucus plugging of some of those airways and bronchioles. It makes it really hard for those people to get oxygen into their body and CO2 out. You've probably heard about asthma before. The causes of asthma are probably complex, involving genetics and allergies, uh, maybe environmental triggers. In any case, it causes bronchoconstriction and inflammation, which can cause narrowing of the airways, and sometimes in an asthmatic attack that could be dangerous or deadly. It's a chronic disease of inflammation uh, that causes narrowing of our airways. So goals to treat asthma would really be to knock down that immune response and decrease inflammation, but at the same time promote bronchodilation. So relax those smooth muscle cells and enlarge those airways. And drugs usually target both of these mechanisms when they treat asthma. Decreasing inflammation and increasing bronchodilation. You may have heard that premature infants have a hard time breathing. You may even hear that called respiratory distress. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why. 
Normal gestation to full term is about 40 weeks, and premature infants born about 28 weeks or less, or even sometimes a little more than 28 weeks, are at risk for this respiratory distress. The reason is they don't produce a chemical in their lungs called surfactant. So remember our alveoli are lined by living cells, living epithelial cells. And so we actually have to have a tiny bit of fluid that lines all the spaces of our lungs in our airways. That fluid, I like to think of it, is protects those little epithelial cells and keeps them from drying out. Well, it turns out that we produce this chemical in that fluid called surfactant. And there's a certain kind of epithelial cell that makes that surfactant. And in those premature infants, they haven't quite made it yet. And so water molecules are attracted to each other, especially when they're close, close together. We call that surface tension, and that water attraction can actually collapse the little alveoli. So again, if you have fluid lining your lungs without surfactant, the little alveoli will tend to collapse. If you add surfactant, it reduces the surface tension of the water molecules, disrupts it, and actually keeps those alveoli from collapsing, which decreases the work of breathing, keeps the alveoli open. So imagine if you're a little premature infant and you have all these little collapsed alveoli, it makes the work of breathing very difficult. It also reduces areas for gas exchange in the lungs. And so in this way, those little um, infants are having a hard time breathing. So they may need oxygen or perhaps a ventilator. All right, that's it. I will see you guys in class.